distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening's uh, lecture. Tonight's lecture is being organized by the Hellenic Observatory here at the school in the European Institute and is organized jointly with APCO Worldwide that is sponsoring a series of lectures on the future of Europe and we're delighted to have the uh, support for this evening. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, this evening. Dr. Arato Kazaku Makoulis is the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Cyprus. Now, it's a little while since we've had an event at the school on Cyprus, and we're pleased to be rectifying that uh, this evening. The Hellenic Observatory is uh, making more of a focus on Cyprus these days in the sense that we're, uh, we have just established a new fellowship on contemporary Cyprus and two new appointees will begin this uh, fellowship uh, in September. And this is the Andreas Hagianis uh, Fellowship uh, here in the European Institute. In parallel to that fellowship on Cyprus, I'm also pleased to mention that we will have a conference on the separate economy uh, here <coughs> at the school on the 10th of February. And we're delighted that at that conference we will be welcoming the, our colleague and Nobel laureate, uh, Chris Pesarides, uh, to speak at the, at the conference. So this evening's lecture with the Foreign Minister allows us to signal uh, our developing focus on Cyprus. Now, Dr. Kazako Bakoulis has been Foreign Minister of Cyprus since last August, but she has uh, previously served as, as Foreign Minister in 2007 and 8. She has had a very distinguished career, serving as Ambassador in the United States, holding a position in the permanent mission to the United Nations, uh, for example, and she has participated in truly numerous uh, assemblies, conferences, congresses <coughs> of the European Union, the United Nations, uh, OSCE, the Commonwealth, etc., etc. <coughs> Even more importantly than uh, the distinguished career in diplomacy that she has uh, accumulated, I'm pleased to note uh, that the Minister was trained in political science, law, and sociology. Uh, you are therefore amongst friends, academic friends, here at the London School of Economics. It means with a combination of her training and the longevity and variety of posts that she has held, uh, she is extraordinarily well placed to reflect on the position of Cyprus today and its future uh, prospects. As we all appreciate, Cyprus, Cypriots, have had reason to uh, often lament their geostrategic position uh, within the region. The influence of successive great powers, mentioning identifying no particular great power in this context, has often uh, been immense and on occasions uh, tragic. Today, however, Cyprus is a full member of the European Union, is about to uh, hold the uh, Council Presidency of the European Union uh, for the first time. And of course, uh, we read in the newspapers with much interest uh, the discovery of uh, fossil fuels in the uh, shores around uh, Cyprus. All of this suggests uh, some exciting new economic opportunities uh, for Cyprus. It seems, therefore, that there could not be a more opportune time for us to reflect on the position of Cyprus today and its uh, future uh, prospects. <coughs> As is normal in these occasions, after the minister has uh, given her lecture, we will open it up to questions and answers from the audience. There will be plenty of time for you to uh, ask your questions. And then uh, <coughs> immediately after the lecture, right outside this particular theater, there will be an open reception for everyone to join us for informal uh, discussions. But before that, can you please join me in giving a very warm welcome to the Foreign Minister of Cyprus, Dr. Uh, Kazaku Makoulis.
Your Eminence, distinguished guests, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure uh, for me to be here this evening and uh, I would like to thank wholeheartedly the London School of Economics and uh, Political Sciences, which uh, in its nearly 120 uh, years of existence has advocated and worked for the betterment of society, reaching out with a global agenda and having achieved an outstanding reputation that has produced so far 16 Nobel laureates. I would like to thank, in particular, Professor Kevin Featherstone of the Hellenic Observatory in the European Institute of the LSE for this invitation and uh, for the organization of today's event. For me, uh, this is uh, an opportunity to discuss uh, with you a topic which uh, for more than a year now has increasingly preoccupied the media in our part of the world, the Eastern Mediterranean, and has uh, attracted the attention of many political analysts and academics. Clearly, developments in the last few months of the southern shores of uh, Cyprus have also impacted elsewhere, drawing the attention of a much uh, broader audience, uh, which uh, has now come to include foreign governments, international conglomerates, think tanks, and academics, and of course, the international media. This increased uh, attention uh, is, understand uh, is understandable and natural given the fact that the strategically uh, sensitive area of the Eastern Mediterranean has added uh, to uh, its centuries long geopolitical strategic importance an ingredient uh, which has been the most central element, perhaps even the most contentious element of the modern era, the issue of energy resources. From the outset, it should be acknowledged that there is great recognition in Cyprus by the government, by the parliament, and uh, by the society at large, that uh, the subject uh, of energy is both uh, promising, but at the same time perilous. We know that it can serve to rebuild, can serve to reunite, heal and secure our country. We also know that uh, it is a subject which holds great risks and must be managed carefully and with wisdom. As such, it is uh, important to state that the Republic of Cyprus is keen on moving forward in this area but will do so vigilantly and responsibly, adhering to fundamental principles which will serve to guide our decisions. These principles are in no particular order of importance because we consider them of uh, equal importance. That our actions will be in line with international uh, law, that we will proceed through agreement and collaboration with those of our neighbors willing to engage in a dialogue with us on the basis of uh, the principles of international law. That we will act within the parameters set by the European Union acquis and, of course, within our obligations to the Union as a whole and towards our citizens, all our citizens. The story of the recent developments in and around Cyprus is interlinked with its history and most importantly with uh, its geostrategic importance throughout ancient and modern times. Since the early Neolithic, times some 12,000 years ago, 
Cyprus has been probably one of the most contested islands in the entire Mediterranean Sea, not only because of its priceless strategic location, but also because it was one of the earliest locations where copper, a crucial ingredient in bronze weaponry, was produced and traded in very large quantities. As a result, Cyprus became a wanted target for many invading powers throughout its tumultuous history. So, I believe it is important to mention, in general, some of the aspects of this historical burden, if I may, of the island's strategic position, because they remain pertinent to this day. The first thing one will notice when looking at a map of Cyprus and its environs mm -hmm. is how small our country is. Yet, it is the third largest island in the Mediterranean after Sicily and Sardinia. The second is how close we are to the European mainland, to Africa and to Asia. In fact, Cyprus lies 280 kilometers to the east of the small Greek Dodecanesian island of Castellorizo and 800 kilometers from mainland Greece, 75 kilometers to the south of Turkey, 105 and uh, 108 kilometers to the west of Syria and Lebanon, respectively, 200 kilometers to the northwest of Israel, and uh, 380 kilometers to the north of Egypt. Anyone who remembers the history of these countries and uh, the wider region of the Mediterranean will be able to connect uh, the dots between empires, ancient and modern, trade routes, north uh, south and east-west, and conclude that Cyprus was historically an indispensable asset from a strategic point of view for great powers, real or aspiring. Assyrians, Egyptians, and Persians conquered and ruled the island until it was liberated in 333 BC by Alexander the Great. Then came the Romans, Richard the Lionheart during the Third Crusade, the Knights of uh, Templar, the French Lusignans, the Venetians, the Ottomans. With the, British, with the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, Cyprus's strategic value became even greater. With this in mind, in 1878, Great Britain, occupied and uh, took over the administration of the island from the Ottomans. In 1914, when Turkey joined, uh, joined uh, Germany's side in the First uh, World War, the island was annexed uh, by the British and in 1925 it was declared a British crown colony. Since then, Cyprus remained important for safeguarding the British strategic interests in the Middle East region. In the words of uh, British Prime Minister Sir Anthony Eden, the British government's position in Cyprus was defined back in 1956 in one word, oil. And he explained, and I quote, our country's industrial life and that of Western Europe depend today and must depend for many years on oil supplies from the Middle East. If ever our oil resources were <coughs> imperiled, we would be compelled to defend them. The facilities we need in Cyprus are part of that. No Cyprus, no certain facilities, to protect our supply of oil. No oil. Empl uh, unemployment mm -hmm. and hunger in Britain. 
It is as simple as that. Unquote. The two British bases secured under the 1960 agreements by which the Republic of Cyprus was established and <coughs> independence was granted still provide Great Britain with these vital facilities, which have been upgraded over the years, <coughs> widened and uh, strengthened, continuing to serve its strategic interests and to define Britain's Cyprus's policy. From a geopolitical point of view, while it is most uh, commonplace to use the term bridge or uh, crossroads to describe Cyprus and its position on the map, it would probably be more appropriate to describe Cyprus as sitting on the jugular vein of any empire worthy of mention. It therefore was critical to control Cyprus, or at least prevent others from controlling the island, if this critical lifeline was to be preserved. But unlike uh, some other critical strategic locations, uh, such as the Bosporus or the Straits of Hormuz, or even Gibraltar and Singapore, Cyprus, in spite of its small size, was also often seized and held for its natural resources. Cyprus was famous, as I mentioned earlier, in antiquity for its copper resources. Cypriots uh, first worked copper in the fourth millennium BC, fashioning tools from native deposits of pure copper. Throughout the Bronze Age, Cyprus was already well known for its rich mineral, mineral resources and the production and export of copper to neighboring countries of the Mediterranean. The recent discovery of the Uluburun shipwreck, which was carrying over 10 ton tons of uh, Cypriot copper ingots when it sank off the southwestern coast of Turkey in the late 14th century BC vividly demonstrates that Cyprus was a major producer of copper for international trade. Also, when the Egyptian or Persian empires sought a timber to build a fleet, Cypriot forests were ravaged. Grains were paid as tribute Salt was traded, copper mine, mined and minted. In modern times, Cyprus was left so poor that a standard quip in the early part of the 20th century was that all we had to trade were carobs. Of course, clever traders made a mint in uh, trading carob seeds to the manufacturers of film used in the cinema industry. Long before, of course, digital age. But uh, though Cyprus may have uh, indirectly, of course, uh, had a hand in the development of the cinematic arts, antiquities on the island, representing our 12 millennia long accumulated and multifaceted cultural and artistic heritage were pilfered by those who appreciated their value, but much was also sold as stone for construction, including for the building of the Suez Canal. In short, two of the constants of the history of Cyprus have been that it was held by foreign powers for strategic and for economic reasons. <coughs> what then has changed? Independence in 1960 was certainly a historic milestone, but this has been marred since 1974 by the Turkish invasion and occupation of a significant portion of Cypriot territory. Another major uh, change 
is that we joined the European Union in 2004 and the Eurozone <coughs> in 2008 and managed to do so notwithstanding the effects of the Turkish occupation, the tremendous destruction on our economy and the unhealed wounds on our polity <coughs> and our society. It has always been and remains an uphill and thorny path, poisoned by the persistent and natural division of the island and its people. But we were hopeful, but we are hopeful that better days uh, are to come with reunification, reconciliation, and uh, coexistence. So in terms of our political history, we have managed to move towards independence, though it has obviously not been complete. And we, came, and we, we became part of one of the boldest and ambitious political experiments, the European <coughs> Union, which can best be described as work in process. I intend to comment later on on the EU, our presidency, and our attitude in Cyprus towards the Union. But at this point, suffice it to say that we view our accession and membership as a strategic development of the first magnitude. The most recent development, uh, as, a last, uh, as of last month, in fact, uh, is that uh, we now know with certainty that of uh, the uh, Cypriot shores, at least within uh, part of our southern uh, exclusive economic zone, Cyprus has rich hydrocarbon deposits. We believe this will have a historic impact on Cyprus. Historic in the sense that it is a game changer because it makes it potentially possible for Cyprus to undergo improvements that will affect all its citizens, work as a catalyst for unification, and most importantly, move from a situation of occupation to one of coexistence and collaboration. Moreover, we believe that such developments will impact positively both on the European Union, particularly in terms of energy security of the Union, but also in the Middle East with real prospects for increased economic cooperation, stability and development among all the countries of the rich in hydrocarbon Eastern Mediterranean region. Cyprus is uh, now at a crossroads of its own with a number of important factors merging together. If this uh, confluence, uh, this uh, convergence of interests is harnessed properly, the opportunities for Cyprus, its partners and its neighbors can have enormously positive results. The positive results of uh, exploratory drilling showing rich uh, hydrocarbon deposits in our exclusive economic zone cannot be emphasized enough. The scale of the findings, which resulted from the drilling of the US uh, company Noble Energy, is conservatively estimated at between five to seven trillion cubic feet of natural gas. These are the results from a single plot and from an initial search. Worthy of mention is the fact that the US Geological Survey has estimated a mean of 1.7 billion barrels of recoverable oil and a mean of 122 trillion cubic feet of recoverable gas in the Levant Basin province, as well as 1.8 billion barrels of recoverable oil, 223 trillion cubic feet of recoverable gas, and 6 billion barrels of natural gas 
liquids in the Nile Delta province in the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm talking about the whole area of the middle of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean covering the exclusive economic zone of Egypt, Cyprus, uh, Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. In the words of uh, U.S. Uh, Geological uh, Society Energy Resources Program Coordinator Brenda Pierce, taken together the Nile Basin and Levant Basin assessments establish the Eastern Mediterranean region as having world-class potential for undiscovered natural gas resources. From an economic point of view, the significance of these uh, first positive results, uh, and I'm talking about this particular block where we had uh, the exploratory drilling, are great. Based on this, Cyprus has uh, approximately 100 billion worth of natural gas recoverable from this single plot that can satisfy the electricity production needs of the country for 210 years. We are already drawing increased interest by major international energy companies who are considering their bid for the remaining 12 <coughs> plots for the second round of licensing for exploratory drilling on other parts of the secret exclusive economic zone. This interest is expected to serve as a catalyst for financial investments in Cyprus. With the increase in investments comes job creation, which will not only affect Cyprus, but will also involve directly the economies of our neighbors, but also many other EU citizens. Moreover, the investment that will be required in uh, infrastructure, maintenance, support services, financing, and banking, all these suggest uh, that the job creation will be long term. This would be a positive and stabilizing development for the region. We expect uh, and we certainly hope that the momentum that will be created by the sort of investment in infrastructure and financial structures for the servicing of the energy industry will serve as a catalyst towards greater cooperation among neighbors. The Eastern Mediterranean is a crowded and most tormented place, and there is a structural interrelation, not only in the geological topography of the seafloor, but also in the sensitive balances which exist uh, on the political level. Already, we have indications that it will be possible to move towards joint exploitation with neighboring countries of the area, along with the launching of uh, joint projects, particularly in areas where uh, the natural gas or petroleum fields uh, fall across the line separating exclusive economic zones. The Republic of Cyprus is actively promoting this sort of um, cooperation through framework agreements which uh, we are currently negotiating with Israel and we are very close to concluding this agreement and Egypt uh, and soon with Lebanon concerning the joint development and exploitation of uh, cross-median uh, line hydrocarbon reservoirs. We strongly hold that uh, not only for our immediate neighbors but uh, most certainly for our partners in the European Union, the presence of hydrocarbon resources in the Eastern Mediterranean will contribute towards uh, greater energy security in Europe, which is increasingly short of uh, sources of energy. As a member state of the European Union, we have a stake in its success and uh, therefore our aim is for the deposits of hydrocarbons in our exclusive economic zone to benefit Europe, its economy, and uh, by extension, its international standing. Europe is uh, short on energy supplies, and uh, some estimates hold that by 2030, we'll be importing 
of its energy sources. Even if the 2020 <coughs> goals of the European Union on renewable sources of energy are fully met, and assuming nuclear power remains an option of last resort, the need for the relatively clean power of natural gas will remain high. We are hoping that the resources in the Eastern Mediterranean, with the cooperation between uh, Cyprus, an EU member, and its neighbors, will uh, be able to contribute towards meeting Europe's needs. Therefore, we look forward to cooperating closely with our European partners and uh, linking them to our partners in our immediate neighborhood and possibly beyond in advancing towards greater energy security and, uh, by extension, broader economic security and stability. The steps uh, that Cyprus will have to take at this historical juncture, a moment that is both full of opportunities and challenges, will require momentous decisions and bold steps forward. This will potentially mark its course in history and reshape its strategic importance. Cyprus will have to engage all its neighbors and its friends, hopefully including also, at some point in the future, once the island is reunited and the occupation is terminated, its northern neighbor, Turkey, which still persists in refusing to have contacts of any kind with the Republic of Cyprus. It is clear to us that Turkey, its attitude and behavior towards uh, Cyprus, its role in the talks between the Greek and Turkish Cypriot communities and its EU perspective are directly linked uh, to developments uh, in Cyprus. We are greatly disappointed, uh, to say the least, uh, that Ankara is not choosing to grasp uh, this opportunity to play a more constructive and uh, more cooperative role, but is rather continuing along its zero-sum analysis. During the past uh, six months, we were dismayed, dismayed to witness yet again the hostile and aggressive phase of Turkey. The start of exploratory drilling in the Cyprus uh, exclusive economic zone, something which has been planned several years in advance and which was not a secret, sparked an angry verbal assault on the part of uh, Turkish leaders at the highest level. I would like to reiterate that uh, we have what we have said many times since. The decisions and actions of the Republic of Cyprus to explore and exploit its natural resources within it, its exclusive economic zone fall squarely within its sovereign rights as recognized by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, of which Cyprus is a state party, and are therefore in full conformity with international law. These rights have been publicly acknowledged by all our partners in the European Union, by all members of the UN Security Council, by the Commonwealth, and a host of other international actors. Then came the blatant threats of violence and provocations which involved uh, Turkish warships and aircraft, air and naval exercises in the sea south of Cyprus, and illegal seismic surveying and seabed mapping carried out by ships on behalf of Turkey inside our exclusive economic zone. But Turkey does not stop there. Its uh, newfound confidence based on real or imagined uh, successes its economic uh, growth, and I'm sorry to say, the unbridled support it receives in some countries has given rise to a neighborhood bully. A Turkey whose foreign minister promoted a policy of zero problems with its neighbors is now asserting a policy of uh, 
only problems. In the case of Cyprus and its exclusive economic uh, zone, Turkey is arguing first uh, that islands have no continental uh, shelf or the right for an exclusive economic zone. And of course, with this uh, logic, neither Great Britain would have an exclusive economic zone. And then that its actions are meant to safeguard the rights of Turkish Cypriots. That is a hoax. The reality is that Turkey cares less about Turkish Cypriot interests and a great deal more about its own strategic interests on the island. Its attitude and strategy towards Cyprus was <coughs> to utilize real or imagined concerns of the Turkish Cypriots in order to safeguard its own interest in the Eastern Mediterranean. Its current behavior is yet another proof of the reality behind this long-term program. Take, for example, the claims that Turkey is, make, is making for an easy of its uh, own, that in some areas on the map, borders on the easy of Egypt, as if Cyprus does not even exist. It would be no <coughs> exaggeration to say that Turkey is not just violating international law. It is behaving in line with the rules of international relations which belong to another era, to another century, long before international law was put in place to guide relations between states. When we decided to seek uh, and uh, work towards accession of Cyprus uh, to the European Union in the late uh, 1990s, our aim was to create conditions on the island which uh, would be seen by the Turkish Cypriots as uh, <coughs> an expression of our genuine desire to, to reunify our country in a democratic, peaceful, and uh, prosperous <coughs> state which uh, respects and safeguards the rights of the individual. On the same basis, our support for Turkey's European aspirations have equally driven were equally driven by the belief that the Turkey, which is harmonized uh, with European rules and norms, which uh, respects human rights, is democratic, and abides by international law in its conduct, a thus fully transformed uh, Turkey can only benefit Cyprus. We are, after all, destined to live in this very close geographical proximity from each other in perpetuity. We are therefore deeply disappointed when we see Turkey failing to progress along its European path. We are disturbed to see Turkey foiling stubbornly its own accession <coughs> process. The negotiation process is not progressing. In fact, it has remained frozen because Turkey is failing to meet its commitments to the European Union. It is failing because, like in international law, Turkey wants to dictate its own terms to the European Union. The statements uh, by its leadership have uh, left no question that they believe that Europe need, uh, needs Turkey at any cost that uh, Europe without Turkey is a miserable Europe, as President Abdullah Gül recently said during his recent visit uh, in Britain. We are hopeful that Turkey, which aspires to be recognized as a regional, if not a global leader, will rise to the occasion. We are hopeful that uh, the Turkish uh, leadership will put aside polemics, diatribes, threats, and adopt uh, a more mild and statesmanlike tone and attitude. We believe that there is room for Turkey to cooperate with its neighbors out of genuine desire towards common ground and mutual benefit. To do that, Turkey must meet its obligations vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. It must meet its obligations in terms of international law. 
Finally, let me conclude uh, by saying a few words about the long-standing Cyprus problem, which has produced so much suffering to the people of Cyprus as a whole. The Cyprus settlement for the reunification of Cyprus, its people, its economy, its society, that have remained forcibly divided since uh, the Turkish invasion of 1974 and the subsequent occupation of 37% of its territory has <coughs> eluded us for over 37 years. I shall not go into any detail on the exact form of such a settlement, except to reiterate the framework that has already been endorsed by the United Nations. A Cyprus settlement must be based on a state of Cyprus with a single sovereignty and international personality and uh, a single citizenship with uh, its international independence and territorial integrity safeguarded and comprising two politically equal communities as defined in the relevant Security Council resolutions. In a bicommunal and bi-zonal federation and that such a settlement must exclude union in whole or in part with any other country or any form of partition or secession. This is the exact quotation from a number of Security Council resolutions that have been adopted over the years. Certainly this is a very general framework and there are many pieces that have to be put together and agreed upon in order to reach uh, a workable, comprehensive settlement. Such a, a settlement should encompass all legal and other instruments and other agreements required to arrive at a functioning federation which would guarantee a secure, peaceful and prosperous environment for all the people of Cyprus, of all creeds, ethnic backgrounds and language groups. What is needed is political will to engage in a productive and substantive negotiation that would identify the required elements on all core issues and put them together as part of a fair and viable federal solution. Although a new effort has started already more than three years ago and more than 130 direct meetings have taken place so far between the two leaders under the auspices of the UN Secretary General, we are still not near making any substantive progress on the most crucial issues of the executive powers in the governance chapter, as well as in the property, territory, and uh, citizenship chapters. The main stumbling block has all along been the position maintained by the Turkish Cypriot side fully supported by the Turkish government, that the goal should not be a federation in the form of one unbreakable federal state with a single sovereignty, single international personality, and single citizenship, as has been agreed and endorsed by the international community, but a confederal arrangement between two separate states with separate sovereignties. This position is still maintained by the Turkish <coughs> side and it is manifested in the nature and the content of the proposals submitted on a number of the core issues with uh, the full encouragement, support and indeed guidance uh, of uh, the entire leadership of the Turkish Republic at both the political and uh, the military levels. Despite the difficulties and obstacles on the way, we continue to persist in our efforts to reunify our country, to reunify our people, our economy, our institutions, and our society in the form of a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation. We shall continue to spare no effort towards the direction of Cyprus's reunification because we strongly hold that such a development 
would be a win-win situation for all parties concerned, primarily for Cyprus and the Cypriots, Greek and Turkish Cypriots alike, for Greece and Turkey, for the European Union and for the international community at large. We are determined to make this vision, however difficult and elusive it seems right now, a reality. We owe its fulfillment to our children and uh, to the future generations of Cypriots. But primarily, we owe it to our country, which must uh, survive as a single international <coughs> personality, a peaceful, democratic, and prosperous place <coughs> for all its citizens, Greek, Turkish, Armenian, Maronite, and Latin Cypriots alike, and as an integral part of the European Union. Especially taking into account the developments from the hydrocarbon discoveries in Cyprus's exclusive economic zone, the prospects for prosperity for all Cypriots once reunification is achieved appear tremendous and should work as a catalyst in the direction of moving the ongoing intercommunal talks forward towards reaching an agreement. We sincerely hope that Turkey, which could significantly benefit from a likely cooperation with the reunited Cyprus in all sectors, but primarily in the energy field, will grasp the message of peace, stability, and prosperity inherent in this new development and rise to the required level of leadership, responsibility, and wisdom. Even at a much broader scale, the whole area of the Eastern Mediterranean has the potential of developing into a success story, into a win-win situation for the benefit of peace, stability, and prosperity of the countries of the region and their respective uh, peoples. Cyprus will be assuming the presidency of the Council of the European Union on 1st of July 2012. <coughs> we do hope that Turkey, which has been openly threatening the EU with freezing its relations with the Union during the Cypriot presidency, will realize that this bullying, threatening, and insulting behavior towards the European Union, towards its member states, and uh, towards its institutions <coughs> on the part of the candidate countries is not at all supportive, rather it, would be, it could be detrimental to its EU accession process. If, on the other hand, Turkey chooses to change her attitude, implement her obligations, and cooperate with the Union based on the rules of the game and her responsibilities as a candidate country, the door will remain open throughout our presidency and beyond. I find it pertinent to conclude with a quotation from another British Prime Minister, William Edward Gladstone, when he said, we look forward to the time when the power of love will replace the, the love of power. Then will our world know the blessings of peace. His wise words are as valid in the 20th, 21st century as they were valid in the 19th century. Thank you very much.
Uh, could we start with the gentleman over here, please, on the right hand side? Uh, please, yes, uh, on the right hand side. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, could I ask uh, uh, two questions, simple, straightforward, which usually is never mentioned, uh, and that is. Uh, the fate of the British military bases in Cyprus. Um, what uh, uh, is the future for them? Uh, do they ever come up in discussions between the two communities? Uh, if they do, what are the attitudes to the problem by each community and their leadership? And number two, uh, about uh, the Armenian community, there's a considerable minority of uh, Armenians in Cyprus who have been there historically and uh, whether Armenians are part of the form formula of the settlement. The minister very nicely talked about the ancient history of Cyprus. Uh, could I just uh, add an addendum that actually, in fact, uh, the whole Cyprus question was uh, invented by the uh, British Empire uh, precisely to scupper the mention of the Armenian question in uh, the when Sultan Hamid uh, uh, sort of massacred the Armenians and uh, Britain uh, as a Christian nation uh, protested and uh, sort of pretended to protect the Armenians, the Sultan gave Cyprus to the Israeli precisely to scupper the international uh, stir about the question. So in view of this, I would be grateful if she could enlighten uh, the, question, the, the, the situation about it. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Let's take a, another question. Uh, the gentleman up here, please. Thank you very much. Uh, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm a business intelligence analyst. And my question is in relation to Cyprus's financial sector, uh, particularly as you stressed in relation to the building up of uh, financial and banking services in relation to oil infrastructure and extraction. Um, how compliant is Cyprus with international banking regulations and um, anti-money laundering, um, you know, your customer uh, procedures, particularly in relation to certain Russian organizations which don't necessarily welcome transparency. And following on from that question, it is related. Um, in relation to the situation in the late 1990s when uh, Cyprus was considering buying Russian S-300 anti-aircraft missiles, and as a result, a Turkish Air Force squadron was deployed to Israel for what was called special training. Um, I'd just like to wonder, how was it that um, the Republic of Cyprus was able to afford considering buying these missiles? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me start with the, uh, the first question uh, uh, regarding the British military bases. Uh, this is not on the agenda of the two communities, as uh, you probably know. Uh, this is not the agenda. Of course, there is uh, uh, there are a number of political forces uh, in Cyprus that are debating this, and uh, from time to time uh, it comes uh, in, the, in the media. Uh, there is uh, a dialogue and there is uh, a debate, uh, even with the British, uh, uh, regarding this. But this is not uh, right now on the agenda. We have uh, the very critical issue of, uh, of the unification of Cyprus. We have the very critical issue of the presence of, uh, of the Turkish forces uh, and the division of the island. So this is our primary objective uh, at this particular point. Now regarding the Armenian community, of course, this is a very uh, precious and valuable part of our population uh, with a very long uh, and painful history uh, in, in its past. Um, the, the, uh, the Armenian community, along with the Maronite and the Latin community, uh, they are uh, a part of the Greek Cypriot uh, community. So in 1960, they had a choice uh, to uh, uh, 
uh, be included either in the one or the other community and the uh, Armenian community and the other communities, uh, the religious groups, they uh, uh, chose uh, to be a part of the Brexit community. So in all these, uh, there is, uh, of course, the interest of the other language groups uh, are taking, uh, and religious groups are taking into account uh, during the negotiations. Now, the financial sector, uh, uh, let me say that, uh, of course, as a, as a member uh, state of the European Union, our, our financial um, uh, banking sector and uh, generally uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, financial uh, sector is fully transparent. Uh, there were some problems 20 years ago, and in fact I was uh, ambassador of Cyprus uh, in Washington when there were, there were some questioning of uh, money laundering and so on. Uh, but since, of course, we became part of the European Union, uh, all this is transparent and uh, there never there was any problem or raising of any problem on the part of any of uh, the international financial organizations that are uh, following uh, these developments in every single country. So our uh, system is very transparent uh, uh, regarding uh, Russian money. Of course, there are Russian money everywhere in the world, including in the Great Britain. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, if you can tell me that uh, there are any problems here, uh, especially in Britain, but also in the United States, there is a lot of uh, Russian money uh, and Chinese money, not a money from <laughs> So, uh, regarding the S300, uh, I was not in government at the time. Uh, it was uh, a decision uh, at the time to purchase this, uh, uh, this um, uh, system. Uh, and uh, I cannot comment uh, as far as the financing of this is concerned. Of course, we have a budget, and uh, a part of this budget was uh, devoted to the purchasing of this system. Okay. Thank you. Uh, could we take the gentleman just here? Madam Minister, Kiriako Chopras, Cypro journalist. Madam Minister, if you of the difficulties for so many years and actually the separation between the two communities. How confident are you for reconciliation and effective cooperation in the event of a solution? Thank you. Uh, the gentleman here is uh, Dr. Walker. Uh, thank you very much. I'm a Turkish Cypriot, and I must stress uh, my disappointment at, at the Minister's uh, historical analysis of Cyprus problem. She has not mentioned uh, any, anything about the EOCA. She has stated that the, the separation in Cyprus has started in 1974. Excuse me, I appreciate those points very much but it's an opportunity to ask a question. So could you simply I would, I would, formulate yes. the same points as a question? It's just that uh, uh, those points have got to be, how can she uh, talk about separation of, the, uh, of, of Cyprus in 1974, when the United, Na United Nations soldiers were on the island in 1964, when Turkish Cypriots were actually pushed into 3% of the land of Cyprus in, in ghettos, and their human rights were denied to them, and on the second point, she's talking about uh, uh, the, the agreements and she's pushing all the blame onto Turkey. Yet, Mr. Uh, Rolandis, who was uh, an ex-foreign minister of, of Cyprus, has stated in his article on uh, the 9th of February 2009, published in, uh, in the British magazine, he states that the Greek Cypriots has rejected 15 proposals put onto them on the Cyprus issue. These are 1948 Consultative Assembly, which rejected it. Okay, 55. Uh, I can go through them. But I would like her to point out how she can try and blame another side where the Greek Cypriots are actually uh, refusing. Okay. Out of the 17 proposals put to, the, to them for solution, they have rejected 15 of them. 
Turkish Cypriots have rejected only one, okay. and two of them have been rejected by both sides.
My name is Fadli. <coughs> I'm a Turkish Cypriot myself as well. And you're quite right when you said that all Turkish Cypriots do not uh, share the same views on the Cyprus situation. I myself believe that most Turkish Cypriots of Turkish uh, Cypriot origin actually do want peace. And uh, 28th of January and 2nd of March proved that where thousands of them descended onto the streets. Now, I share your hope that the discovery of natural gas will hopefully produce a settlement. Now, your government has said that they are willing to share that gas with Turkish Cypriots. Do you feel that you're getting across to the Turkish Cypriots on that issue, or do you feel that the Turkish Cypriots, ordinary people, are getting that? Or do you feel they are getting that message from you? Basically, that's my question. Thank you. Very much. I'll start with the last question uh, because uh, uh, regarding natural gas and regarding sharing the Turkish Cypriots, I think uh, uh, President Christoph uh, has uh, from uh, the highest uh, possible uh, level from the podium of the General Assembly, uh, he sent a very strong message uh, to the Turkish Cypriots. He sent a message that uh, uh, through reunification, uh, the two communities will be able to share this incredible wealth uh, that we have discovered in our exclusive economic zone. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a message of peace, uh, this is a message of prosperity, and uh, I do hope uh, that uh, the Turkish Cypriots uh, will receive this message loud and clear. Uh, and I think that uh, from what, at least from the context I have, uh, there is a lot of interest in the Turkish Cypriot community. Of course, we have to acknowledge that the Turkish Cypriots are and remain under the overwhelming military, economic, and political control of Turkey. So uh, I do hope that uh, the Turkish Cypriots, who are now a minority uh, in, the, uh, in the occupied area, to the point that um, it seems that the estimates we have of the Turkish settlers uh, is uh, around 300,000, even more. Some Turkish Cypriot uh, friends are telling me that there are 500,000 uh, Turks from the mainland. I don't know. This is not, uh, I mean, there has not been a, a proper census under the aegis of, uh, of the United Nations, as we have suggested, to ascertain the, uh, the exact number. Uh, so uh, we do hope uh, that, uh, that the Turkish Cypriots will receive this message. Uh, now, during uh, the um, uh, negotiations, uh, and I come to the second, uh, to the second question, uh, during the negotiations, uh, so far there has been agreement, and this agreement has not been challenged by either side. Uh, there has been an agreement that uh, the responsibility for uh, the uh, natural resources will be, will rest uh, in the federal uh, government. So it will be uh, at the federal level. Uh, so this is an agreement that was already reached during the negotiations and has not been challenged uh, by either side. So it's there and of course with reunification, uh, with participation of both communities in the federal uh, structure, in the, in, the, in the government, in the other bodies of, uh, uh, of the federal uh, state, uh, of course the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots will share from this uh, uh, wealth, uh, which is the hydrocarbon uh, discoveries. Now on Syria, on Syria, of course, as a member of the European Union, uh, we uh, join and uh, we have the same position as uh, all the other members of, uh, uh, of the European uh, Union. We have, uh, from uh, the very start, we have uh, condemned these uh, uh, killings uh, and uh, the loss of life of, uh, uh, of our Syrian uh, uh, brothers and sisters. And uh, of course, <coughs> we have demanded, along with the rest of the European Union, uh, the removal of, uh, of the Assad regime. Uh, 
We have joined also in the sanctions that have been imposed, been imposed already uh, on Syria. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, that through this uh, pressure, through this uh, sanction, we will have a change uh, to democracy, we will have a change to the much needed reform uh, in Syria, as it was done, of course, in the, in the, Arab, uh, in the other Arab uh, uh, Spring uh, uh, countries. Now, we have a particular concern regarding Syria because we are so close. I mentioned that we are only 105 kilometers uh, from uh, the shores of Syria. So in Syria, uh, we have to do it right because it's a much more difficult situation, a much more complex uh, situation, taking into account uh, the uh, composition of, uh, of the uh, population and the different sects and groups uh, within the population, but also the fact that uh, Syria uh, and the Syrian army is uh, very strong and anything that will go wrong uh, will have a very, very uh, negative uh, spillover effects to the whole region. So uh, this is why we are not in favor, as many of our partners in the European Union, we are not in favor of a military option in, uh, in Syria. We are in favor of uh, the sanctions. We are in favor of uh, the other forms of uh, measures uh, against the regime, but not uh, not uh, military option. Okay, yes. Time for some more uh, questions, please. Robert McDonald from the Economist Intelligence here. Your um, probable reserves are not really substantial enough to cover the cost of infrastructure to ship it abroad to Europe. What you really need to do is to aggregate these reserves with those from Israel, Egypt, and Lebanon in some way. The most logical thing to do would be to pipeline them up Western Turkey directly into the grid going to Austria. Can you see any way in which these resources could be used as a bargaining counter with the Turks to make some sense out of this new resource that you have. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yes, the gentleman here. Theo Theodorou, uh, coordinator lobby for Cyprus. Um, Cyprus, uh, through history, has been a victim of its geostrategic position. Will the discovery of hydrocarbons translate to a likelihood of the 200,000 Greek Cypriot refugees peacefully returning to their homes? Thank you. And finally, the gentleman here. Thank you. My name is Thanasis Gavos. I'm a correspondent here for Sky and Radio Astra. I just wanted to ask you, how do you judge Britain's stance in all of this regarding the Cyprus problem? And is there something that they really could do, and do they do it? Uh, okay, I'll start with the first one. Uh, we are in the process uh, right now because of this uh, initial assessment. Uh, it's not the final assessment because uh, more drilling needs to be done in that particular uh, uh, plot uh, in order to um, ascertain not only the actual quantity but also the quality and ways how to extract it. Uh, so uh, we are at the very initial stages uh, and of course uh, uh, we are uh, we have established already a committee, which is a committee of experts. We are not experts. We haven't had this experience before. Uh, so we have um, uh, sought uh, the, uh, uh, the assistance of experts from different parts of the world, uh, ranging from Norway, that have been already uh, exploiting natural gas and oil uh, for years, but also from, uh, from other countries. Uh, it's a committee of wise men, as they call it, but there is a woman also in that <laughs> And uh, of course, they, they will be advising the government how to go about uh, pipeline is one option. Understand that uh, I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to, uh, uh, to pretend as an expert. Uh, but there are other options. Uh, there is uh, the uh, liquefaction uh, in uh, 
building the necessary infrastructure uh, on the island. Uh, and this is something uh, we are uh, also discussing <coughs> in Israel, but also with uh, uh, the other countries uh, in the region. Uh, so I cannot tell you which of these options uh, we will uh, choose at the end. Uh, and uh, definitely this single uh, discovery is not uh, enough. It will be in cooperation with, uh, uh, with the other countries. Already Israel has uh, discovered uh, in one of the, uh, uh, of the uh, drillings uh, something like 18 trillion uh, cubic feet of natural gas in the Yabiafa and uh, around 9 trillion cubic feet in Tamar. Uh, of course, we have another 12 blocks which are going up uh, for the second round of licensing. So we expect that we will have more uh, discoveries in the next uh, few years. So this is, uh, I would say, it's a, a process uh, uh, which is developing. Uh, we have not made any final decisions yet. Now, regarding Turkey, uh, this is something we can uh, discuss, of course, provided that Turkey uh, terminates its occupation of the island, and, uh, and of course, Cyprus is really happy. And you're uh, kind of uh, uh, avoiding the question uh, about the British. Oh, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Regarding the hydrocarbons and the return of the refugees, uh, okay, this is uh, not. Uh, interrelated, but as I said, uh, we hope that this uh, discovery, this wealth, this huge prospect for both communities will act uh, as an incentive, will act as a catalyst for the reunification of the island. And of course, through reunification, hopefully, we will have also restitution of property, return of refugees, coexistence in a regional country, homeland of both communities. So this is, in a sense, uh, my answer to your question. Now, regarding uh, Britain, of course, uh, with Britain we have uh, long-standing uh, relations. We are uh, part of the Commonwealth. Uh, we share uh, a lot of uh, bi common values. We are partners in the European uh, Union. Uh, but, of course, uh, we agree that we disagree on a number of issues, <laughs> and I want to remain at that. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess you're a diplomat. Um, Including the Senate. Thank you. Uh, could we take perhaps one more question, the gentleman in the back? This will have to be the last question. Uh, Jason Theo, George, Global Coordinator at Nibomac. Um, with a view to the large amounts of foreign investment uh, that will take place in Cyprus in respect of the hydrocarbon discovery and the considerable revenues that will be generated as a result, has Cyprus thought about how it would, cons uh, how it would deal with the uh, considerable revenues and financial transactions that will take place, uh, perhaps in line with the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund model to ensure probity and uh, transparency in the transactions? No, in, in fact, this is a model that we are uh, examining. Uh, definitely, the sovereign wealth uh, funds uh, that uh, are being established in, in uh, uh, hydrocarbon produced, uh, producing uh, uh, countries uh, is uh, very important because uh, we need uh, uh, to uh, make sure to ensure that uh, this wealth uh, is uh, secured for uh, the future generations. So the model of uh, Norway is one. There is another model of Qatar. But I think that the model of Norway is uh, one of the best models. And uh, it has already uh, had uh, very good results uh, in uh, uh, generating more income from, uh, from this uh, wealth. But this is something that, uh, of course, we will be examining at the right time. Uh, let me tell you that from now until uh, we have uh, this revenue, it will take approximately eight years. So we still have plenty of time to examine all this. And of course, there is plenty of time to solve the second <laughs> Okay. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, 
be is a reception just up the stairs uh, to which you are all uh, welcome. But I'd also like to emphasize that really it would only be fair to allow the minister and the person sat next to her to get to the bar first. <laughs> uh, so if you could please remain in your seats for security reasons, if you could remain in your seats as standard at this evening, uh, and I will escort the minister to the reception and then you can come and uh, join us for drinks. Before finishing, can I give a very warm thanks to the minister for uh, her speech and her willingness to answer so many questions. It's been very enjoyable indeed. Thank you.